Okay, um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and uh, giving me an opportunity to present some of our work here. Uh, yeah, as pointed out, I want to discuss about finding uh, purifications. Um, with minimal entanglement. And this is a work uh, done together with Johannes Hausschild, who is a student in Munich, and it's published in Archive 1711-01288. So let me just uh, first give a brief outline of what I want to do. I want to first tell a little bit about uh, matrix product states, because so far there has not been any introduction to them, and then show, or say a few words about uh, what the concept of purification actually is, and then I'm going to bring this together and show how we can then uh, use matrix product states to simulate um, mixed quantum states. And the main results <coughs> that I want to show is that, so the main result is that they show a um, matrix product state, um, which I abbreviate as MPS, um, based method to iteratively minimize um, the entanglement. Of purifications. So let me now start by introducing matrix product states because I assume that not everyone is familiar with this concept. <coughs> so for everything in my talk, I will focus on one-dimensional quantum systems. So I will assume one-dimensional systems, say of length L, and we have a um, local Hilbert space described by states uh, Jn, where Jn is going from 1 to d. So we have a d-dimensional local Hilbert space. And having uh, these kind of systems, then we can write down a kind of generic quantum state can then be written as psi is just the sum over all j1 to jl over some amplitude in a many body wave function times the product state basis of j2 oops j1 jl so this is now a gen kind of generic state so every state in this system or this many body system can be expressed in in this form um, however there are uh, then two to the l com complex numbers that we need to store and that makes it incredibly difficult to to deal in this full representation and this is a representation used when using uh, exact diagonalization, so then we just construct a 2 to the L cross 2 to the L dimensional matrix. Oops, thanks. And uh, it would be 2 for a spin 1 half system. Now, this state can then be re rewritten in terms of a matrix product state uh, MPS representation. And the MPS representation is given where we now take the amplitude of the 
uh, many body wave function and express it in terms of a product of matrices. So we have matrix B1, J1, B2, J2 to B L, J L. No, um, these are now different matrices. So there are some index. So the first matrix here would be, say, a one cross D dimensional matrix, and the last matrix would be a D cross one dimensional matrix. So in generic, the, the um, dimension of these matrices would be uh, chi n cross chi n plus one uh, cross D. So, so this is now a one-dimensional system with open boundary conditions. Uh, <coughs> and in fact, every quantum state that we can write down on this Hilbert space can be brought into this form by uh, uh, successively applying Schmidt decompositions of this state. Right? So say that we first start from a state in a full representation, and now we can successively do uh, Schmidt decompositions at these bonds, and by this bring it into this form. I mean, I was not planning to tell you exactly what the algorithm is or the um, uh, sequence, what you have to apply to actually get it into this form, but you can bring every quantum state into this form. So every quantum state it uh, can be brought. Um, into this form. Huh? Say it again, please. What are the dimensions of the intermediary matrices? Can you say it again? Example? So, say that we take a generic quantum state uh, and we just follow this procedure that I just advertised, like uh, where, we, where we use this um, singular value decomposition, then we would, for example, do a first a bipartition between the first spin and the last spins and do then a Schmidt decomposition. So we would then write the state as the sum over um, uh, alpha is from 1 to the um, minimum of, uh, say, d to the l and, oops, d to the small l and d to the capital L minus l over lambda L, um, say left and say right. So, and then this would now give the dimension of the matrices here. So for the first bond, if I do this decomposition, then we would need D states, so then we have D. The next one would be a D cross D squared matrix and so on. And then once we go across the center of this chain, then we would uh, again have uh, smaller matrices. And the last one would then be D cross 1. So if we kind of follow this kind of generic uh, procedure, then it actually doesn't help us much because here we had uh, kind of exponentially increasing uh, Hilbert space. And now if you just choose this representation of matrices, then we actually have now um, However, kind of the maximum of these kind of chi um, n is in the of the order of uh, d to the power of uh, l half. So, so that gives a scheme like every quantum state can be brought into this um, matrix product state form. Uh, for example, using this um, singular value or Schmidt decomposition. Uh, however, the bond dimension grows exponentially with the system size. Well, it turns out that there is, or this kind of uh, format, or this kind of way of expressing the wave function is efficient. I could put it's an efficient representation uh, for slightly entangled Entangled systems. Okay. 
So what this means is like if I calculate spatial entanglement, so say if I just do a cut of a system into two halves, say the left half and the right half, and I look at how strongly the left part is entangled with the right part, and I find that it's only slightly entangled, then I can get away with a much smaller bond dimension than uh, what you would need for a random state or for a strongly entangled state. So in particular, we will then find that the maximum entanglement or the max maximum bond dimension can be much smaller um, um, than uh, d to the um, l half. So in fact, we can then maybe go to even infinitely long systems and get away with a small um, constant chi. So say that this is um, our chi and this chi is much smaller than uh, the, the, the exponentially uh, growing dimension. And uh, this is particularly true for ground states of gapped and local Hamiltonians in 1D, for uh, which the area law holds. But moreover, it's also true if, uh, for if we have local Hamiltonians and gapless ground states, then we actually find that the maximum of this chi n that we would need is actually just growing polynomially with the system size instead of exponentially. So this kind of way of representing states gives us an efficient way of representing quantum states if the states are slightly entangled. And this is actually also the reason, or like uh, uh, this way we can explain why numerical methods such as a density matrix, density matrix renormalization group, and also the TEBD method uh, by Giffre Vidal, which was mentioned already this morning, uh, works so um, nicely to describe the one dimensional systems. And uh, this is particularly true for ground state properties, but it also helps for quantum quenches as long as one, uh, these quenches do not generate too much um, entanglement. So, particularly if we uh, do a quantum quench and stay at relatively short um, time scales, or we have a rather low defect density, then um, this method um, works extremely well. Good. So, and what we uh, want to do, like uh, what I want to um, get at at some point, is we want to look at the dynamics and uh, also statics of uh, mixed states, right? So, so at this moment, we are just talking here about a pure quantum states. We want to go over um, to mixed states. And uh, for this, I will need to do some acrobatic moves with these um, matrix product states. And for this, it will actually be quite useful to adapt a sort of schematic representation of matrix product states. So schematic uh, representation of matrix product states, or actually in general. <laughs> um, so what I want to do is, uh, uh, instead of matrices and uh, scalars, etc., I'm going to just write some symbols. So for example, if I just write uh, a circle with nothing sticking out, that would be just a, a complex number, for example, some C. If I just write a circle with some line sticking out, then this would be just some vector with one index. Uh, and if two indices are sticking out, then it's just a matrix Mij. And moreover, we can just use it to uh, contract, or um, <coughs> if we have like, uh, if we contract various tensors. So, for example, uh, a matrix matrix multiplication would just be something like this: we take two matrices and we just uh, connect this line, uh, and then this is now the matrix product, right? We have like the matrix M and the matrix N, and we just multiply them by contracting over one index. So, using uh, this tensor or Penrose uh, representation, we can write down the full many-body wave function, it's something like this, it's like a, a brush. So where we have the, the wave function as a big um, rank uh, or order L tensor, and then we have here uh, L legs sticking out. And, and of course, 
to represent this object, we then need uh, um, d to the l complex numbers. And when we write it, uh, or when we compress it in terms of a matrix product state, then we just write it in, in this form. So now here we have then the matrices B1 to BL. And then we see that if we contract all of them together, then we actually get this blob that we, um, uh, where we have then the full wave function. And uh, um, but I guess this, this is relatively clear. Is it clear to everyone to use this notation? And in fact, this notation you see also on the poster for the conference. So, um, good. So now we have the uh, representation of pure states in terms of the matrix product states. No, the matrix, so if we just follow um, this example here, then the first matrix will have the dimension of 1 cross D cross D, right? So, so this is now the, the last one, the last D. And then the next one is uh, of dimension D cross D squared cross D, and so on. So I guess you can attach a number to every yes. edge. You need labels. Anyway. Uh, well, I mean, this here, this lag, this one here would be J L minus 1, and this would be J L. Is this what you mean? No, I mean the dimension of every Dimensions in between. Yeah. They are something different, not the same states. Right, I mean, this is dimension D, this is dimension D squared, this is D dimension, and so on. Yeah. I could also just uh, make thicker lines here and so on. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so this is um, how we can deal with pure quantum states. And now I actually um, want to come to um, how we can purify mixed states, right? So because in many cases, we would like uh, to work with mixed states. So for example, if we want to look at the dynamics at finite temperatures, or if we want to look at uh, um, uh, quenches at uh, finite temperatures, etc. So then there are many cases where we're actually interested not in the dynamics of uh, pure states, but we like to simulate mixed states. But this framework, first of all, gives us a powerful way to simulate uh, pure states. So, and for this, I uh, want to introduce the concept of purification. So, in the statement um, is the following. So, we have a, a density matrix density matrix uh, rho on some Hilbert space HP, like this P is for physical, this is uh, our physical Hilbert space in which our system lives. And we now um, represent it as a pure state, pure state um, that lives in uh, some enlarged Hilbert space um, H, uh, P direct product H Q. Um, like this is a pure state psi such that rho is equal to oops, the trace of Q So we just enlarge the, the Hilbert space um, such that we can, such that the density matrix that we are interested in is um, I'm on. <laughs> so, so that the um, density matrix that we actually, or the mixed density matrix that we're actually interested in is the reduced data density matrix calculated from the density matrix of Psi by tracing out these um, subsystem. And in fact, it is always, always sufficient, sufficient to choose um, HQ identical to 
H physical. So formally, formally we can always um, find a. Um, we can um, on, or, um, formally we can always find. A, we can always find the purification. Uh, um, find psi by diagonalizing. Lysing a uh, rho and in for um, thermal steady states this gives us the thermal field uh, double which means we have then psi of beta equal to one uh, to one over z times e to the minus beta e n half times right so, so these are now the um, eigen these are now the eigen um, vectors uh, th these are now the eigen vectors of the reduced density matrix and the uh, corresponding eigen energies uh, however, this is not a um, unique representation. So the um, thermal field thermal field double is only uh, one possibility, one possible possible purification. And in fact, the um, physical density matrix is independent of uh, of unitaries <coughs> acting on acting on our physical uh, our on this uh, uh, ancilla space on this uh, unphysical space Right, because if we just uh, calculate this trace, then any unitary will be undone that acts only on on Q. And while it doesn't matter for, I mean, if we're just interested in some purification to get our uh, physical density matrix back, every, I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of purification we choose. However, our of uh, yeah, um, goal is to actually use matrix product state or this matrix product state formalism for these purified states and for this matter we actually want to keep the entanglement um, low so we want to be able to represent the purification with a relatively small bond dimension so what we actually and this is now the the main goal of what i want to show <laughs> is we actually want to choose want to choose the <coughs> unitary which we can call um, u q or u ancilla uh, such that is it such that it minimizes the entanglement And then there's actually a name for this. So if we find the, um, uh, the minimally entangled uh, purification, we call it the um, entanglement of, of purification. So and this brings us now to the third part. So where we no look at the purification in the MPS form. So... What's entanglement? Oh, thanks. So, the entanglement that matters to us, or um, in order for the representability in terms of the MPS, is the um, spatial entanglement between the degrees of freedom. So, if we have uh, our kind of purified state 
living on, on this kind of physical system. The, and now our state psi is defined on, on this system, where we now double the degrees of freedom on each side. The entanglement that we want to reduce is the bipartite entanglement for um, cuts like this. Yeah, I'm going to specify this also in a moment. So, sorry, is the entire is the unitary operator the entirety of the freedom that you have in choosing this um, purification? Yes, because the moment I mean, it will be, yeah, I just draw some schematic representation of what we're doing. Then it's maybe also getting more clear um, what what the degrees of freedom are that we have. So, so now we have this. Uh, way of purifying our state, and we can now uh, bring it into the matrix product state form. So now we can use the MPS representation of this uh, purified um, state, and we now have the amplitudes of our um, purified state. So now we have degrees of freedom, um, which are JP physical 1, J Q1 and then J like dot 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 uh, J L physical J L Q and this we write now as something like this so it's a matrix product state where we have now two indices on each side um, and the upper one here are now describing the physical uh, bits and or physical um, states, and these are the lower ones here are now the ancilla states or the auxiliary states that we have. And in order to then obtain the full or the, the, the density matrix that we then get, rho is then just a trace over these uh, extra indices. So the way that we could then write down the, the density matrix would be something like this. Um, where we take now the two copies of these. So, so this is now um, psi and this is now psi um, dagger, where we just flipped it around. Uh, and then you see that any kind of uh, unitary acting on these uh, goes away. So, so, so the uh, physical density matrix rule will not depend on any unitary operation acting on these ancilla states. So, so how do we work with these purifications now? So, so now we, we actually know how to express uh, density matrix into this form, but the, me uh, like the, the way that I presented here to get a purification would actually require to completely diagonalize our density matrix. This is something that's certainly not feasible for a, uh, a larger system or for a sizable system. So how do we do this? So the idea is now that certain purifications we can just uh, write down very easily. So in particular, if we take an infinite temperature, like an infinite temperature, temperature purification, um, infinite temperature uh, thermal field double, um, can easily easily represent it. Easily represent it. And in particular, if we have the, uh, I call this now psi naught, because beta is naught, uh, beta is uh, zero, uh, can then be expressed simple as a product state of um, identities, right? So in particular, this corresponds just to a um, product over all, all sides, um, let's call it like M over one over um, square root of D times sum over Jm of Jm physical Jm Q so so now we actually know how to write down the infinite temperature 
uh, um, thermal field double or like the, the purification of an infinite temperature state is now really simple. In particular, this is just a product state where we just have a bond dimension of uh, one. Um, let me see. So, so now we have the um, state at um, infinite temperature, which is uh, incredibly simple to write down. In particular, it's very well suited for being represented as a matrix product state because it's just a simple product state. So, and to go from here to um, finite temperature states, we can then um, use kind of well-known MPS techniques, for example, the TBD algorithm to go to finite temperatures. So finite, finite temperature, states obtained by imaginary time, time evolution. In particular, the state psi at a beta is then, so we take now our, our infinite temperature state and now we can, let's assume that we only have a, uh, a nearest neighbor uh, interaction, like an um, Ising type Hamiltonian. So now we can just evolve it in imaginary time. Something like this, acting only on the um, physical indices. And this one here is now going to e to the minus beta half. And of course, this continues up to uh, um, having a sufficiently low temperature. Um, so I'm not explaining the details actually how to apply these gates to, um, to, the, to the MPS, but this is uh, straightforward to the, uh, like for example, this TEBD algorithm. So what is the role then played by the infinite temperature? You could have started from any density matrix pretty much, or was it important that you started from Say zero. Well, we cannot start from any density matrix, right? So if, uh, if, if, for example, you start from the density matrix for the ground state, and you just act on it with uh, the um, with um, e to the minus beta h, then you're not going to a state at um, temperature beta. So here, actually, the point is that we want to start at infinite temperature, and we cool it down. Does it make sense? There must be still some freedom. So is there some freedom from where you start when you apply this? Yes, the freedom we have, and this is uh, what I pointed out here, we have a degree of freedom on the, uh, uh, these ancilla indices. Right? So we can, we can basically apply any unitary um, to this auxiliary um, degrees of freedom. And then this is, well, this will in fact be the, the main part what we want to use. So, so we want to choose the, um, so, we, so, so this is actually the main part that we want to um, find the purification that's best suited for us. We want to particularly find a purification where the entanglement is um, reduced. Right? And if we, and then this is actually what I um, want to, um, come to now. So now I want to reducing the entanglement. Because the, the framework is now clear. So we have this framework of purification, how to represent uh, the mixed state in terms of a pure state. And also the uh, 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 objective is clear because if you want to use this degree of freedom that we have to have a, a particularly nice purification for our system. And the way that what we actually want to do is we want to choose this unitary in, in, in a way to reduce the entanglement of, of our state. And for um, 
performing quenches or performing time evolutions, there was uh, already a rather simple idea. Uh, simple idea. Simple idea for real time evolution. Time evolution. Which is going down to a paper by uh, Christoph Karasch et al. a while ago, was to uh, um, perform um, perform a, a backward backward time evolution evolution on the uh, uh, ancilla indices. In particular, the idea was uh, if we have now whatever um, starting state that we, for example, obtained using um, this algorithm um, and we want to evolve it in time. So if we just uh, take, for example, a steady state that we obtained using this method and we act on it with some local operator, say this is now just a, a local quench or we want to calculate some dynamical correlation function, so we act on it with some operator, um, say B here, then we can just obtain a state <coughs> b as function of t and beta, which would mean we uh, obtain, we just take here, so we just apply here a time evolution of uh, u of t, where u of t is just uh, e to the minus i th. And they actually showed that, they showed numerically that in many cases the entanglement growth or the entanglement uh, that's building up can be strongly reduced by simultaneously doing a backward time evolution on these ancillas, right? So, so here we just uh, evolve it forward in time on the physical indices. Now we can do whatever to the uh, ancilla indices and they showed that if we just evolve it backwards in time that this is actually strongly reducing the entanglement growth of the system. But it turns out that First of all, this is um, not ideal. Not ideal in many cases. And moreover, it doesn't work uh, whenever we do imaginary time evolution. So it does not work. Does not work um, for um, uh, imaginary time evolution. So, and the idea that I mainly want to propose um, now is how we actually can optimize um, this unitary. How we can, like I want to propose some algorithm that actually allows us uh, to approximate <coughs> the minimally entangled state. Um. So the idea now is the following. So we are using uh, the method that I just introduced. So we use this uh, uh, kind of bond-wise uh, time evolution. So we um, follow we follow each each trotter step step um, by acting. with a row of uh, disentanglers. Yes, um, um, and in particular, what we're doing, we um, minimize the um, second uh, Rennie entropy. <coughs> Uh, 
the second Renier entropy is given by S equal to minus log of trace of rho squared, uh, rho reduced squared. Right? And using this um, schematic that I've shown before, we actually now have our purified state. Now what we are doing is we just act with a two-side gate, oops, a two-side gate uh, performing the time evolution. Uh, so this is now our u time, and now we iteratively uh, try to remove as much as entanglement as possible by some u uh, disentangler. And the way that we find it is by numerically or uh, iteratively minimizing the second um, Renyi entropy. Uh, and the reason why we choose the second Renyi entropy is because we can actually nicely calculate it in a, in a closed form. Uh, uh, particularly what we are interested in, we are interested in calculating the trace of rho squared. So, so we want to maximize the trace of rho squared. And we can simply calculate uh, trace of rho squared <coughs> the following way. So if we just cut out, just say this, block that we are now actively working on, then if I just write it in this form, what this actually is, this is basically, this is now my state uh, given in a, in a mixed representation. So this is in the everything left of this blob, it is expressed in terms of the Schmidt states to the left, everything right is ex expressed in terms of Schmidt states on the right, and here are the local states uh, expressed in this <coughs> Um, the states um, J and uh, J prime, or J Q and uh, uh, J J P. So then, from this, I can write down the. Den this is now the the density matrix rho calculated. Yes. Um, I have a question on so the first total step on the on the physical initials. Do you already do a truncation there, or do you keep it exact? At this level, I, I keep it exact. Also, so, so I just uh, apply this guy and now have a, an increased bond dimension um, at this bond. And now I just choose this guy uh, for this, yes. Mm -hmm. Can I ask also a question? So, uh, naive question. Suppose that you don't do any of these uh, disentanglers and you just try to evolve. Uh -huh. What's going to happen? Is it uh, is it going to work or is it something going to break down? Oh, it works. But it's just that the, um, uh, this is, I'm going to, Show some data in a in a minute, yeah. uh, and then you see why why this is actually favorable to do something on these uh, extra indices. Mm -hmm. Frank, how do you define this row? Is this row the previous row? Oh, this is row reduced that I want to calculate. But how do you define it? Uh, well, I define it. Thanks for pointing this out. I mean, this is now the reduced energy matrix. For the um, this is relevant for the entanglement of this one-dimensional chain, so I just do a bipartition in such a way that I cut my system into a left part and a right part um, here. Thanks. Good. Well, um, given that time is passing by, I just uh, rather quickly draw this picture just for amusement. So, so this is now what we have now. This is now the density matrix calculated for the full state. So, so this is now just uh, psi psi. Now, in order to get the reduced density matrix for um, this bipartition, so I have to trace out this part. Oh, and here I just insert my, this is now my, my uh, unitary that I want to use. So, so this is now, if I just do this drawing, then this is now the reduced density matrix for a bipartition as uh, shown here. But I want to have the square of this, so I just take two copies of this guy. And now I can just uh, multiply these. Now this is a uh, row reduced times row reduced, and I can calculate the trace by just multiplying, by contracting these <laughs> indices. So, so this is now uh, the trace of rho reduced um, squared. 
uh, and this is the expression that I want to minimize, uh, maximize. And there are different ways that I can do this. I can now use a gradient descent method to do this, or I can uh, use a, a method that also used for well, for well known. So if I just want to uh, optimize it with respect to uh, the constraint that this two being unitary, then one can use a trick that one is just calculating the derivative with respect to u, and uh, then uses a polar decomposition. But but there are some technical details. Then we have some algorithm that converges relatively well to actually maximize this and by this minimizing the um, entropy. And now let me just uh, then um, come to some of the, the results, uh, the numerical results that we get applying this algorithm. <coughs> um. So, the first part will be on kind of um, now cooling down uh, to a kind of a purified state. And uh, as I just pointed out before on the, uh, on the board, is that we can just simply start from an infinite temperature state. So this is just a, a product state. It doesn't have any entanglement. And then we want to cool it down. And ideally, what we want to do is we actually want to find a state where we have now a ground state with a particular entanglement in this direction. Uh, and we want, don't want to have any entanglement uh, between the uh, ancilla uh, degrees of freedom for the zero temperature state. So now if we just numerically do it, if we just uh, use a thermal field double, uh, so we just do what uh, you've suggested, Slava, so we just take this infinite temperature state and we just cool it down by only acting on the physical degrees of freedom, then we get this red line. So, so then just, um, st we start at uh, zero zero entanglement, and now entanglement is built up both between the physical degrees of freedom and the ancilla degrees of freedom. And what we actually then find is twice the entanglement <coughs> of the actual ground state because it's a direct product of the ground state on the physical degrees of freedom and the ground state on the ancilla degrees of freedom. If, however, we are using um, this uh, technique to, to iteratively minimize the entanglement, then we get this uh, purple line or this bluish line uh, where we actually see that first it looks quite similar to what we get without doing anything, but then the entanglement is gradually uh, reduced and eventually we are finding exactly the um, uh, entanglement of, of just a single copy of, of the ground state. And we also see that this is not done very continuously because this means that here it doesn't converge perfectly fine, so it's just getting stuck for a while and then only it's uh, removed a little bit later on. So, so that clearly um, can uh, use some further improvement, I guess. So, and why is this nice? So if we actually can do this perfectly, so if we don't have uh, uh, artifacts from getting some tails in the uh, distribution of the Schmidt values, then in principle that means that the bond dimension that we require for efficiently representing the state is actually going to uh, the square root of what we would need without this optimization. Yes? So I don't understand is how, um, so, so there are theorems about the entanglement of low-lying states, right, that say that, that the entanglement is bounded mm -hmm. in one d But you're cooling down from, from a product state initially mm -hmm. through, through highly entangled states. Right, but there's indeed also a theorem uh, by, what he says, a, uh, an argument by uh, Thomas Bartel, who actually argues that uh, finite temperature purifications can also be effective, uh, can also be efficiently represented in terms of matrix product states. So, so then we actually do have, uh, we will have some maximum of the entanglement in between where we have uh, um, basically this, uh, this kind of crossover from kind of classical uh, fluctuations to kind of quantum correlations. And, uh, but, but this ma maximum will always be at a finite um, value. And it doesn't matter if your, if your final ground state is critical or something, or? Um, <laughs> well, if, if we, if we, uh, but now I'm just, uh, I'm not 100% sure this is correct what I'm saying, but what I suspect is that if we have a critical system, then we will only have at zero temperature a uh, um, logarithmic divergence of the entanglement entropy. And any finite temperature, it will actually have an area long. I suspect that this is true, for at least for one dimension systems. So for the 
the entropy of the reduced density matrix? No, the entropy of the purification. No, th this is true for the um, reduced density matrix. But, but for the purification, I think it's, uh, it's true what I just said. Good. Um, this is what I want to show for, or let me also say, like, um, I have no idea if there's something useful in this information, but there's a particular way how this entanglement is, uh, is reduced. So, so here we start then from a ground state and we now just uh, gradually reduce the entanglement. This is now showing the structure of how the entanglement is removed. So it builds up some sort of uh, um, cone structure. And this is actually at a for a state at criticality. Um, so, so I find it interesting, I don't know exactly know um, how to interpret it, that, um, uh, that it just takes the longest to, to remove the entanglement from, from the um, center bonds. Good. Um, so, so this is all that I want to say for, <coughs> for um, steady states. And let me now come to, um, to these quenches. And this is now um, showing again how it helps. So, so now we do the following um, experiment. So we start from an infinite temperature state um, and we act on it with a non-unitary operator. Right? If we were to act with a unitary operator on an infinite temperature state, then of course the entanglement, the entanglement growth of our optimized state would be, there would be no growth, it would always be zero because we can just always find a, a unitary that completely undoes whatever the unitary time illusion is doing. But if we did something non-unitary to it, then we cannot completely remove the entanglement. And now we compare, um, this is the entanglement growth that we would get without doing anything on these ancilla bonds. Uh, this is now the entanglement that we get from a backward time evolution, um, the idea proposed by Karash and al. And if we use the um, optimized form, then uh, this, is, this um, purple line is what we um, get. So the entanglement is actually strongly reduced to what we would get from other methods. So that's the good news. The bad news is um, shown in this plot. This is now shown actually the um, growth of the bond dimension. In particular, we do here the following. We're just doing the simulation with a very large bond dimension um, so that the time evolution is, exactly, is, is, is exact. And then we actually see to which, like how much we can reduce the bond dimension um, with a certain truncation. And actually it turns out there we only gain at short times and at long times, not really. And the reason for this is because the um, Schmidt spectrum that we truncate develops some tails. And uh, the, this is since the um, uh, Renyi entropy might not be, or certainly is not the optimal cost function to minimize for reducing the number of states that we um, need here. So, so, but here we're actually still experimenting, trying different ways to um, do the um, disentangling. This is, um, and, and this is like also for, uh, uh, oh both, um, all the data that I'm shown here is, is done for a simple um, transverse um, Ising chain with a um, longitudinal and uh, transverse um, field. And lastly, I want to apply these ideas to a system uh, with, to a disordered system. So I now switch from the um, Ising chain to a uh, Heisenberg model, um, like nearest neighbor spin one half um, Heisenberg model with a disordered longitudinal field where we choose these disordered field from a uniform distribution uh, between minus w and uh, plus w. And this model is uh, known to exhibit a um, many body localization transition, in particular if w is um, smaller, so, so, so this model has a uh, kind of many body localization transition, transition uh, uh, and the critical value for uh, uh, W is, is approximately 3.5 uh, J. So, so, and then these plots here are showing now the kind of spatial entanglement distribution of the purified state, right? So we actually see, and this is now what we get without any disentanglers. So, so here we see that the entanglement is actually growing rather uniformly and linearly throughout the entire syst um, system independent of disorder. So this is a clean case, this is a weakly disordered case and strongly disordered cases. But if we now turn on the disentangler, so we just do the same simulation but now we remove the entanglement, we get this picture. So, so then it actually turns out that there's a, 
uh, light cone in which the uh, entanglement in this uh, purified state cannot be removed. So in effect, we see for uh, the clean case that we see a kind of nice linear light cone. And if we go into the regime of the um, strongly disordered case, then we actually find that instead of having linear light cone, we find a logarithmic um, light cone. And this is exactly compatible with the slow entanglement, a slow logarithmic entanglement growth that we actually find in, in these um, Hamiltonians. So, so and uh, uh, yeah, that I found quite, quite neat how basically the algorithm exactly finds uh, this um, logarithmic um, growth, at least it's compatible with the logarithmic growth. Okay. Yes? So this was at infinite temperature? This is at infinite temperature, yeah. You have infinite temperature, you apply a local quench by flipping a spin? Yes. This is a Yes, is, is, um, as, as shown here. So we just, I just take my system, I just act with a non-unitary uh, operator, like I mean, this is S plus operator, on a um, physical spin. And then I just look uh, at the perturbance, like uh, the perturbation done by, by this kind of spin flip. Yeah. So you can clean up a lot of entanglement outside the, this cone? We can only remove, right. But you can completely remove it. Outside the cone, we can completely remove it, as we would expect, right? Uh, I mean, does, that would also be, be immediately clear from the kind of brick wall structure of these unitaries that whatever is away from this cut, we just can completely remove. And then from this, we, 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 we would if you always get a light cone, but it turns out if we just localize the system, we can actually also clean it out. Uh, um, that, that was precisely the intention of my question. So this cleanup that you can do, Mm -hmm. Is it given by the structure of the circuit? No, it's given by the structure of it. it's by the physics by the by the by the, by the physical speed at which uh, information propagates. Because this is what you see here. That's why I say that. Right, but in the first case, in the first case, you have propagation. So you have the circuit will have its own causal structure. Yes. And then you have the physical propagation. Right, but what we see is the physical. So, so this was not given by the structure? No, but the, the circuit is the same in all th four cases here. Right, but in the first case, the circuit was not, was not already giving you this causal coin. It was slightly different. Uh, ye oh, yeah, of course. I mean, but the, the, because the, um, the, the structure of the circuit will actually depend on, on the time step. Even, right? so, so, so the, the circuit of the, like here going, I think we used a time step of like 0.1 or something like that. So, so the, the circuit would have already extended far beyond what, what we see here. Okay. So, so there's something I think. So this circuit that you're using to design time, do you, do you optimize it local in time or global in time? Like on the full? Um, the, the way that these, we, we tried out different ways, um, but the, the data that you see here is then we just apply one layer. So we just apply one layer of imaginary time, ev uh, of real time evolution here. And then we just do a layer of uh, disentanglers on the um, on the um, ancillas. So it's just one time step in a sense. Right. Like, so we just do one time step in physical time, and then we do <laughs> one uh, disentangling sweep. And but it doesn't really matter so much. So we could also do a number of time steps and then remove. But then the picture would look differently because if we just would do a disentangling every n steps and the entanglement would again grow away from here. But then I mean, if the goal is minimizing like the final uh, uh, chi, I mean the final bond dimension mm -hmm. of the NPS, shouldn't be like the time dependent variation of principle already optimal in this respect? Well, but the time dependent... If you do this optimization that you say locally in time, if you do it globally, I can believe that this thing mm -hmm. can be better. But, but then, no, I, I mean, um, in fact, one thing that we thought about, but, um, but we haven't implemented it very carefully, is the following. If we have these um, purified states, uh, then if we just use a time-dependent variation principle, uh, how would we implement it? So, so then we would uh, act on the um, physical degrees of freedom with a, a real-time evolution. But the question is, like, what do we want, like, how to act on the ancillary degrees of freedom? And actually one thing that we thought about but we haven't carefully implemented is that we define some sort of entanglement Hamiltonian, which is basically the gradient towards the um, low entanglement states. 
And then we could use the time-dependent variation principle. But if we just use the time-dependent variation principle on the ancillary degrees of freedom, I think then we would get a similar picture to, to what we see here. In fact, uh, I think this is all that I wanted to say. Last plot, now is this a, a, a different way to, to look for many body localization transition in large systems? Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, one, one thing which again we haven't done very carefully, I mean, why I think this is nice to diagnose many by localization is that um, here we can now cool down to, so, so this is now for infinite temperature, which basically includes all states, but we can also cool it down to uh, lower temperatures and then do ex this experiment, then we might just diagnose even the many body localization, many body uh, mobility edge. But there are even some questions on the, on the precise location. Can you mm -hmm. open in the middle of the spectrum where you could think infinite temperature is kind of like the, the middle of the spectrum? So yeah, it might give slightly better data than what we have seen before, but still the problem is that um, if we are in the regime where the system is not many body localized, the even like the entanglement that we have within this cone is, is significantly. It's still uh, like uh, basically the entanglement entropy or the, um, um, the, yeah, the entanglement we are still growing linearly with the, with the size of the light cone. And which means that this, the number of states that we need to, <laughs> sorry, <coughs> the, the number of states that we need to keep is still growing exponentially with the, with the linear size of the light cone. Yeah, it's not a complete solution, but it might still go beyond it might, exactly, if it's all sites or so, which are away from complete diagonalization. No, no, I do agree. It's, uh, I mean, I, I have hopes that this can push us a bit further to what we did before, but we haven't pushed the limits yet. Mm -hmm. I think there's no more questions, but 